So a massive welcome to, to Derek James, CEO of Symphonic. Um, I believe this is your first time at the European Digital Banking Summit. It's so. my first time at the Digital Banking Summit, yes. So I uh, hope to thoroughly enjoy the, the two, two or three days here. Excellent. OK, I'm sure that you will. I don't know if you'll enjoy the next few minutes, but I'm sure you'll enjoy the summit. Um, so, so tell us a little bit about Symphonic. So where, where do you guys come from? What's the, the backstory? OK, well, I, I guess um, we probably started our journey as far away from banking as, uh, as you could get. We were a university spin out. We, um, we spun out of one of the Edinburgh universities, and, and primarily with a focus on health. Um, but very rapidly realised that banking had, um, to some extent, some of the same issues as health, and I'll maybe talk about that later. But um, we, we spun out of Edinburgh Napier in 2014, so we're just, just about to get to our sixth anniversary. And we focus very much in, on identity and access management. So um, that's a broad church. It's a very large category of, of software products and solutions. But we saw that most of those focused very much on the identity piece. Um, and we don't worry so much about the identity as long as transactions are attached to a, an unauthenticated identity. But we provide a, a much richer platform for making sure that transactions are properly authorised, particularly in complex um, environments, and I would count health and finance in both of those categories. Um, so I guess our, our, first, our first client, in fact, was in health, and if I can indulge um, the audience for a bit, uh, myself, we, we, we work with the NHS in London where they have a huge challenge, 1,800 organisations who have a need to share data um, amongst those organisations for the benefit of the patient. And if you can imagine the security challenges in that process, there's a, a constant need to balance the security aspect of protecting what's very sensitive data with the, the need to provide a, an easily accessible service to the clinicians and indeed to the patients um, who need to access that data. So that was the foundation of, of the business and then we very quickly, in the end of 2015, I think, um, you know, identified that finance, indeed, particularly in large organisations, had some similar challenges. You know, data was siloed, users were siloed. Um, we went to one bank who had was running their internal systems on 450 instances of Active Directory. Um, you know, the basic question of who has a right to, to access what information was not being met. Um, so we stepped into that um, bank and worked with them, and I'm happy to say this year we've, uh, after a long process of product development and making it right, um, we've signed a fairly lengthy contract with them. Okay. So that's the background of the product. Nothing to do with banking at all. Yeah, brilliant. But quite the quite the step from healthcare into into banking. It is. Um, but you know, as I said, there are some parallels. Um, lots of regulation. You know, and if you think in in, in banking, open banking and PSD two. There's a need to open up um, back-end systems to, to many more um, individuals and channels and, and actually a regulatory need in, in banking through open banking and PSD2. And the need along that, that journey to, to make the right balance between customer experience and security, you know, two very, very sensitive um, you know, sets of data. So although you know, from, from a sector perspective that was a, an enormous jump, Actually, you know, the business problem had some 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 degree of similarity. Um, I think the, the points of difference, perhaps, are the are the throughputs in in digital banking. Um, you know, we we see an enormous velocity of you know transaction. You know, many millions of transactions. You know, in any given period, where there may be thousands in health, but um, that's a challenge that we we address as you know as well as part of our solution. Mm. Okay, great. And so you mentioned there, kind of, I guess, about <laughs> regulation, and yeah. so. So why now is, is what you offer to banks more relevant than ever? I think, I think the regulation, both open banking and PSD2, comes with a dismantling or a, certainly a repositioning and reformatting of the security boundary. You know, we, I guess you know, banks, like many organisations, had a, a much, much more control over the you know, security posture against the outside world. I think with, with, um, with open banking opening up... Um, you know, much more uh, access from outside. And, and in fact, you know, regardless of regulation, we see mobile as a, as a new um, and, and growing channel for, for accessing data. Those perimeters are becoming a little bit fuzzy. So there's a need, you know, as part of the transaction process, to check much more 
both in terms of the validity of the identity itself, but also, you know, other factors. You know, the um, TPPs are they are they legitimate TPPs? What do the consents look like from the customer? A whole complexity in, in, in data attributes that need to be checked to guarantee the rightness of that service. Mm -hmm. So with increasing, um, with increasing adoption of regulatory frameworks globally, obviously in, in the UK we, uh, we, um, we are installed in, in, in a number of banks in the UK and also in the, in the central regulatory authority. Um, that need to you know, to, to constantly, for, for each um, sort of microservice, to, to check all of those data attributes is, is growing in importance. Um, some banks, uh, we, we, we bank with a, a, a major international bank and, you know, they don't get it right, you know, and I say that as a customer rather than as a supplier. You know, we are constantly challenged, we are constantly engaged with fraud and risk and that's because they're, they're not taking a very nuanced view of what needs to be checked before they raise a flag and say this is a, a problem transaction. So mm -hmm. it's part about security, but partly about you know, enhancing that customer experience through just getting it right each time. Sure. Well, I mean, that hits on one of the probably the biggest challenges that certainly the bankers in this audience will face is around that constant balancing act between keeping things safe and secure, but keeping the customer experience pretty frictionless. Yeah. So how does Symphonic help banks achieve that balance? Okay, I, I guess in, in some respects, what one is about nuance, we, we deliver two major capabilities in terms of functionality to the authorization process. One is, is a very fine-grained approach, so we can, we can um, protect individual you know, data cells. We can, you know, uh, if you think of scopes in, in open banking, we, just as a natural um, byproduct of our feature, we can, we can just D deliver those scopes to, to the transaction depending on the consents. Um, but we also uh, believe very strongly in moving aspects of managing the policies that regulate authorization out into the business community. So, you know, from a technical perspective, our product um, comes in two parts. One is very much about the technical plumbing and identifying where all the bits of data are that either need to be protected or, or, um, or examined as part of that transaction. That's a technical setup configuration piece. Um, but in that, we abstract all of those terms so that they are, are business terms. And we, we then permit business users to, 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 to manage their stance dynamically. You know, if they see, you know, fraud and risk is a, is a big consumer of, of our product and one of the implementations we have, they, they're able to adapt their stance, you know, depending on how they see, you know, you know environmental threats. Um, much more readily. So that means that you only have to drive, for example, step up behaviour in clients when, when it needs to be um, to be driven to that because you know, no, no, no clients, no customers like to be constantly having to you know, step up their authentication um, you know, in, in order to con conduct what they may see as, as, as perfectly um, simple transactions. So it's, it's twofold. One is about sort of fine-grained and understanding the context. That's very important. And the second thing is actually passing control to, to the business function. Um, quite, quite often fraud and risk. Um, it could be, you know, customer, um, you know, customer directors and, and, and so forth. And certainly in the design process for, um, for implementing our stuff, we, we are very much about centralizing all of that logic so that we define it once and use it often. Okay. Um, I think the first, the first bank that we engaged with, we asked the question, how many applications do you have in the bank? And the answer was 18,000. 18, and um, with the best will in the world, it would be impossible for anyone in that bank to actually claim to understand who was having rights to do stuff and to access stuff. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, all right, so, so staying on that, that vein, so you've kind of, Steer down a lane of how difficult it can be sometimes mm -hmm. to start an engagement with a bank. Yeah. Um, we, we already heard in a discussion earlier that partnering with fintechs is probably one of the most important things that banks can do, uh, but it's easier said than done. So yeah. talk us through what a typical engagement with a bank might look like. Okay. I, mean, I, I think I'd maybe like to preface that by, by just, just, it's difficult for the bank, but it's also very difficult for the startup. Yeah. Um, the first question that most banks ask when, when you rock up to their building and um, 
say you have a solution as which banks have you been working with before. So it's an incredibly difficult place for, for a startup to, you know, to begin that journey. But I guess from the bank's point of view, and picking up um, just point that he made earlier about, you know, you can have the funkiest uh, product or claim to have the funkiest product um, in the market, uh, and you can claim it's you know easy to adopt and it's inexpensive and um, it's easy to integrate. Um, and we went through that journey with with uh, with one of our banks where they liked the functionality that we were providing. They, they saw the business benefits, but they, they were honest and said, you cannot implement this here because you, know, you need to think about you know, supporting a bank with 20 million clients and the resilience and the performance and, and all of the things that go with that. But that was a very mature bank and they helped us through that journey. So I think from a bank's point of view, um, I guess I would, I'd make a plea that you know, where you do see um, you know, fintechs or innovative companies bringing something to the market is, is, to, is to help them on that journey. You know, banks have got a lot of, uh, a lot of intellectual uh, brain power um, and, you know, and, and startups by their very nature are small, they, have, they may have a good idea, but you know, helping that sort of industrialization process to, to turn it from an idea into a product is, is an area where banks can add tremendous value to the, to the fintech community and the innovation community, I think. And what is the, the most helpful thing that banks can do then in that process? I think, I think it's coming along on the, on the engineering journey. Um, obviously, um, proof of concepts and, and, uh, and, and so on are great for driving out, uh, are crystallizing some of the benefits, but also maybe articulating some of the uh, learning points that, are, that are, a, a supplier needs to take on board to develop the product. And from that point, actually, you know, to, to, to come back to the question that you, that you asked, you know, in terms of the, the engagement you know, process for us, you know, from beginning to end, we love to do proof of concepts. You know, and I think you then get to understand not just the, you know, the technology landscape, but also, it was mentioned earlier on today, the culture. You, know, you need to be able to, um, to work comfortably in, in the culture within the, the client, who is, is, is by definition much larger. Um, much more um, complex an animal than, uh, than than a startup or even even a scale up. I mean, we're now we're now 35 people. We're hoping to grow to 50 this year, but you know, compared to you know a lot of the banks that we deal with, they have many thousands. So, getting that sort of culture fits right. Um, we love to start with the proof of concept, and that defines, I guess, some of the use cases um, which can start to support that move towards a production environment. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about you know, both the bank and the the the, the vendor, uh, Symphonic in this case, understanding quite clearly what success looks like, um, and I guess you know using the experience of the proof of concept to, to start to plan those steps towards success. Okay, um, great. Okay, cool. So, so we work for you know, main, mainly big banks in this room, yeah. uh, and sometimes take for granted some of the, the the challenges of smaller companies. So, what, what's been the biggest challenges you guys have started to scale? You know, you've gone from a couple of people to thirty five, and yeah, we, we plans to go to fifty. What's how's that working? Yeah, we we set, we set out in two thousand and fourteen, literally in a cupboard um, in the university. Um, before we got our first premises, and we we had a, a big product idea. Um, you know, it, it's a it's a very richly functional product. We we have to integrate with many different operating models, technology, um, landscapes. Um, you know, there's the whole cloud versus on-prem and private cloud. There's a whole raft of technical challenges. So, I guess the biggest challenge for us was was finding the right talent. That was one of the challenges. Um, Edinburgh is a, is a very vibrant um, tech city, as, as many cities in Europe are. Uh, getting the right talent was absolutely key, but also um, getting that funding journey um, as we grow was tremendously important. Um, significant products take time to develop. Um, they also take cash. So that dialogue with, um, with investors through that journey was tremendously important. We, we, were initially backed by an angel syndicate. They're now, they've now completed uh, four rounds with us. And in the last round, we had mo much more significant funding from a, a VC organization. But I, I think those are, those are the two, I, I guess I would call them internal challenges, um, which are probably faced by most startups. But 
you know, the big challenge remains if you're going after a, a sophisticated, highly regulated market like banking, um, you need to identify some, some clients who believe in the product and are going to help you in, along that journey. That's just hugely important. Um, regulation comes not just in terms of the, the relationship between the bank and it, its, its customer, but, you know, you're looking at, you know, banks are looking at their supply chains, so you need to demonstrate financial stability and you need to demonstrate, you know, adherence to, you know, uh, processes, you know, ISO 9001, 22301, I could bounce uh, numbers around on the ISO scale, um, you know, it will. So the, it's, it's becoming from that, those three, three men in a cupboard, if you like, to, you know, to a mature company and developing the processes and the maturity um, to, go, to go to the next stage. So we now have, have uh, clients in the, the US yeah. and in Australia. We have a, a bank, one of the largest banks in Australia, um, use our product for their open, open banking um, approach. Um, we've just signed uh, last month our first bank in the US. Um, and uh, you need all of those sort of elements of maturity to be able to do that. Okay, great. So it sounds like a, quite, quite the story that's emerging. So um, I, I guess two-pronged question. So, so what's been the proudest moment so far on that journey? Um, and, and what comes next? What, is, what does the future hold? Okay, um, I guess, I guess the, pro, the proudest moment, I mean, you, we were founded to, to, to produce a product to market and to sell that product and, and, and to go on and build a company around around that. So I guess, you know, one of the proudest moments was was acquiring our first customer, I guess, and getting uh, and, and uh, you know, get, getting that license in and getting the product working. It, it, it was in health, um, a fairly large implementation. But I guess, you know, beyond that, the probably the proudest moment, both for myself and the team, was, was, was just a couple of weeks ago when we had gone live for, for a bank uh, on their PSD2 um, programme and we had a, an unsolicited, it was a very complex program. There were 15 work streams and several different pieces of technology being brought into the bank at the same time. And um, it was a difficult journey. You know, it's, it's, you're getting all of those moving parts together into a coherent, um, a coherent solution um, against a, a fairly tight time scale was, was a difficult process. But we got a, a really um, fantastic letter from the, our main, our main client uh, contact, um, which was not about the product and was not about me and was not about you know the directors. It was about the guys on the ground who had um, just stuck with it through all of the inevitable challenges that you know implementation programs have, and um, and you know that that was a fantastic thing. That was a real endorsement for me that you know it's not just about product. It's about team and it's about you know the organisation being able to, to meet client requirements. So that was a fantastic thing. Low points, um, I guess we, uh, we've had a great strike rate on, on converting proofs of concept to, to, um, you know, to, to sold li and installed licences. We, we dropped one and we've only had one, um, one failure in that. And, and that was a low point because we had produced a what we thought was a, a fantastic technical solution and, and satisfied the client need. But we were dealing with a, with, with a company which was part of a much larger group. And uh, our, client, um, our client contacts decided in their wisdom that you know, this could be fantastic for the whole group and kicked it upstairs and was never seen again. And you know, it's, um, it's the nature of large organizations that their priorities naturally are different from you know, from, from some of the subsidiary companies. So that was, that was a, a fairly low point, I guess. That would have been our first international order as well, which was a bit of a shame. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I, th I think other high points are, um, you know, de developing a, a distribution channel globally, which is important. So I mentioned that, you know, we've, we are 35 people at the moment in Edinburgh, which, um, you know, has, has some geographic challenges, but we are able to, to service clients in Australia and the US because we've, we've developed um, partner relationships which can support that journey, which is great, and support the journey for the client as well, So, um, which, is, which is great for us and great for the clients. Great. And as you look into kind of 2020 and the future, what's the thing that you're most excited by? Um, I think we, 
we um, we now have a very strong foothold in banking, um, so we need to, to maximise the impact of that and uh, and uh, take our solution to a much wider market. And I suppose to some extent that's one of the reasons I'm I'm here to you know to spread the message in, in this context. But we also see uh, we see needs for for our solution in, in different markets. Uh, open banking is a thing, um, you know, and it's come about for good reasons. I think. Uh, that's just the start of a journey towards open everything. And that, that um, concept of you know, customers and third parties having much more access to data uh, is, is likely to be important in many more sectors. You know, if you look at pharmaceutical research, um, if you look at insurance, you know, I think there are already discussions in the UK about open insurance, which is perhaps less, a, a less transaction intensive um, sector but you know it's, it's just part of that journey towards more and more people and um, being more and more connected with data which is held in more and more places mm -hmm. and you know when that starts to happen and we start to break down those barriers those security boundaries then the need to take a much more nuanced view on on transaction rightness is is only going to grow sure. so um we may we may look at geographic expansion to the states as well which is clearly a, a large market Okay, um, perfect, great stuff. And I guess to that point about why you're, why you're here, yeah. um, you know, so we do have a, a captive audience of, of, of banks in the room. What would you say to the, the, the banker that sat here that's like, well, you know, I'm quite comfortable with where we're at on authentication. What, why, should they, why should they want to talk to you guys? Okay, authorization, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, th I think you know, the world is changing. Um, there are competitive pressures. You need to develop um, compelling digital so, um, solutions uh, for clients. You know, there's a lot of competition, both from um, challenger banks and, you know, we've spoken about Google and and uh, maybe Uber next, who knows? But, you know, there, there's a lot of competition. So you need to use the power of your brand, I think, to develop a, a, a compelling um, digital interaction with clients. Now, that's a very expensive process if you're not addressing that with what I would describe as a modern architecture. So um, our biggest competitor is do nothing. Uh, but, you know, doing nothing is expensive. You know, we have to put the, the logic that sits behind authorization in each individual user journey separately. We're relying on programmers to do that consistently. We're, rel we're relying on things not changing, regulation not changing, because when it does, we have to go around and change each of the different each of the different implementations of policy. And I think um, if we are to deliver a modern solution that's compliant with regulation and gets that balance between um, customer experience and security right, you need to be looking, if not Symphonic, at a tool like Symphonic. And we do have you know, competitors in the market. Um, but you know, I think this is an idea that's, whose time has come, just in terms of making the uh, the creation and maintenance of a, a strong digital platform, a much more straightforward and well-governed process. Uh, okay. So um, there's a few things going on there. There's the customer experience, there's the, the governance and regulation angle. Um, there are lots of, of benefits that can be derived from, from adopting a, a solution of this sort. Great stuff. All right, so you heard it here first, folks. There's never a better time to speak to Symphonic than, than now. Uh, my understanding is you're going to be taking some, some kind of meetings while you're here, and you're going to do a demo? We, 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 have, um, we have arranged a number of meetings, I think. Um, those of you who have signed up for those um, will, will know when those are. But we also have, um, we have a, a, a demonstration um, set up if anyone wants to, who has not organized a one-to-one, -one, if anyone wants to, to sign up for that. Um, I can tell you what you're going to see. We've cr created a little dummy mobile app um, on, a, on a laptop, and we've just changed some of the parameters in the environment against what, some, against the, what Symphonic does, and we can you know, demonstrate how that impacts on the way that the mobile application is, behaves. Um, and you know, that, that ought to, to give you an idea of, of how controllable it is by a business user, but also you know, some of the the auditing and, and you know, sort of capacity for supporting compliance, how, how that works as well. So I would encourage any of you to go and look at it. It's a, it's a great demo. I've, 
I enjoy it myself because it keeps evolving. So, uh, in fact, there's an evolution which I haven't yet seen myself. So, uh, I may go and you uh, can go look at the demo. I may go and do the demo <laughs> myself, but my colleagues will will um, be, be more than happy to to demo the product. Brilliant. Uh, let me take the opportunity to to thank you, Derek, for thank for you. your time. Um, it's great to have you here as part of the uh, the summit, and uh, we're much. looking forward to hearing more over the next couple of days. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks.